Good afternoon. I'm really excited and humbled to be speaking to you again today. Uh, so thanks for that. I hope you're all enjoying yourselves. Uh, I know I have. Um, we'll be talking about revolutionizing cybersecurity, or at least the approach that we took within NXP. Now, before we start, this will not be a technical talk about cybersecurity. So whoever thought that this will, will be technical, I mean, it's still a, time, it's a good time to leave, but you're more than welcome to stay. Um, let's go. My name is Saki. I work as portfolio manager within uh, NXP cybersecurity. Uh, NXP cybersecurity within the IT department, which basically means that I lead all the uh, IT projects that we do that are cybersecurity uh, based. Um, NXP is a company that creates semiconductors. Semiconductors are typically the microchips that you find in a lot of devices, practically all of the devices. Uh, but we are, major, we are uh, in principle focusing on four markets, the first one being automotive. So in automotive, think of the, the radars that you have in cars, think of the braking systems, think of the airbags, think of everything that's basically electronic in your car. There's a very big chance that we have produced a chip that's in it. Second, we are very big in industrial and IoT. So you can think of all the robots, all the sensors that we have somewhere. Uh, that's also technology that we produce. Third one, and that's maybe much closer to ourselves. Uh, what we are doing is we will also create a lot of microchips for the end consumer, so mobile. Think of uh, mobile payments, think of wearables, think of passports, payments, whatever it is, we provide the technology. Smart thermostats, smart lighting, we do it. And the uh, last uh, market that we focus on is actually communication. Communication, I think the most relevant, or at least the most recognizable, will be 5G. We are a major player on 5G antennas and also on 4G and so on. So what I want to do today is I want to basically break this talk up in three major pieces. Um, three major pieces being, I'll first sketch a bit the context. Then we'll go into how we retrained our champions. And the last is a gift from myself to you, because you're the best audience ever, obviously. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll come to that also. Um, let's first, oh yeah, before we start, I also want to break this up to, into a Q&A. So the sooner I stop, the more room we have to do a Q&A, if there are any questions. So first, let's start with, uh, with the context. What are, some of the, what are some of the words that we think of whenever we are thinking of high-tech? Because NXP works in the high-tech industry. What are some of the words? Just shout. Nobody shouts? <laughs> Let me do it for you then. <laughs> Let me do it for you. Whenever we're thinking of high-tech, of high high-tech is high-paced, uh, focused on the future, uh, lots of innovation, uh, uh, lots of highly skilled engineers that we have, um, uh, lots of money, lots of secrecy also, because stakes are high, right? We have, we have lots of IP to, uh, to protect. Now, um, having said that, high tech is also an industry focused on the, on the future. So it will bring us AI, it will bring us IoT in our houses, it will bring us self-driving cars in the near future, and so on. Um, but there's also a lot of mystery because it's like behind closed doors. And there's a very valid reason for that. But it's also very high paced because the, 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 the pace at which technology is moving is really incredible. Uh, having said that, we are also not immune to reality. And reality is that we are shifting generations, that we have Gen Z and millennials coming our way, and that the top-down leadership 1.0 doesn't work anymore. You cannot, you cannot shout to a Gen Z and say, hey, because I'm at a certain position, you need to do X, Y, and Z. So that doesn't work. Also, what we want to do is we want to enable champions, so our engineers that work today for NXP, we want to enable them to do their best job without burdening them or without burdening them in, in all kinds of uh, administrative tasks. They should do whatever they do in which they excel. Um, and the last uh, part is also, we don't want to instill a rigid framework. So we should 
we should uh, create a framework that allows our champions to actually excel and then it's our problem how we get the data out of that and how we consolidate data. So uh, what are we seeing? Uh, we are seeing that factory-like setups as we knew them, they are gone. We are seeing that uh, leadership 1.0, whenever there's someone screaming because he has a certain position, that's also gone. What we are trying to do is we're also trying to get rid of silos. Silos worked, do not work anymore. Um, and what does that basically mean? That means that we need to retrain our managers and our leaders. Um, not only our managers and our leaders, but that means that we need to retrain the entire company. Uh, and how do we do that? Well, basically we start small and tightly we start tying the knots and, well, progressing. <clears throat> All right. Let me move to the, to the next one. Retraining our champions. How did we actually do it? And there's a, I don't know if anyone recognizes this guy? No? This is, this is Chuck Yeager. I hope I pronounced his name right. Um, and what this guy did was basically the following. It was about in 1947, 47, yes, um, when there was a lot of scientists that said that the sound barrier couldn't be broken. They said they even had, had hard data to prove it. So what they did is they said, hey guys, you cannot break the sound barrier because if you try to break the sound barrier, Either the pilot will dissolve, the airplane will dissolve, he will lose his voice, whatever. All, all kinds of crazy stuff today, but at least it was believed like that. So what uh, Chuck set out to do, he, was set out, he set out on a mission to prove them wrong. So in 47, he did it for the first time. He broke the sound barrier. A couple of weeks later, he did it again, and six years later, he flew 2.4 Mach, so 2.4 times speed of, uh, of sound, which was uh, quite interesting. Here's the interesting thing. Whenever they asked Chuck, hey Chuck, how was, the, how was the flight? He said, well, it was actually a disappointment because the flight went, the faster I went, the smoother the flight. And there was actually no, uh, no hard barrier. The only barrier that he had was in our minds. And the same holds for this new way of working and for this cultural shift that we're trying to do. We have some mental barriers that we need to overcome. But how do you overcome them? Well, basically we have three options, right? We can fight, flight, or freeze. Freeze is not really a good option whenever there's a tiger approaching you. Fight is the best option, and flight can be if you're a good runner. But we opted for fight, right? Fight means action. So how do you get people to fight? How do you get people to take action? You communicate. You communicate very well. And second one is also you talk to people. And you talk to people because you need to know intrinsically what motivates people to get them moving. You need to communicate your purpose. You need to work on that. Um, and with, with, with coming in, so communicate purpose and so on, what I mean is you need to work on your self-awareness as a team. What are, what are we actually trying to accomplish as a team? Uh, not because some manager says so, but because the team actually says so. So what we did is we had at a certain point in time, we had several, uh, uh, several meetings, internal meetings. We had off, uh, off sites and so on, um, where we basically said, hey guys, let's look at what we did in the past. We drew a line in the sand and we said, no more of this, no more negativity, no more complaining, no more this doesn't work, no more, yeah, we tried it before, but we are a special company. No, no, we stopped with that and we start with a fresh sheet. So that's what we did. Uh, important to remember is that whenever we are talking change, all change is emotional. I know that everyone says, yeah, but people don't like change, but I bet that everyone here in this room likes change. And why am I saying that? Nobody has a, has a, has a phone with a cord anymore in his home. Uh, everyone uses smartwatches, smartphones, and whatever. Uh, why? Because everyone likes the change that they actually like. Nobody likes to be told that they need to change, but everyone likes change if they like it themselves. So we can change, people want to change, they don't want to be changed. That's the difference. So where does this change then actually come from? It comes from a lot of introspection, it comes from listening, and it comes from setting a path together as a team. But the first part is introspection. We need to figure out what it is that we actually want to do as a team. So how did we... Uh... <coughs> yeah, this was... <laughs> 
Sorry, I was so in my, in my, in my talk that I forgot to click the, click the slides. <laughs> but anyway, so what we see is that a lot, of, um, a lot of times what we see is that people focus on what needs to happen, how it needs to happen, and they forget the who. They forget the who part. The what and the how is actually pretty easy because we will figure it out. Even if it's, especially if it's technology, we will figure that part out. Uh, but if we don't have people on board, we will fail. We will eventually fail. So, um, <clears throat> this is a guy that we, that I bet nobody of us met personally. It's Mr. Taylor. He lived in the 1800s but he's still influencing our work today. Why? This was the guy that actually worked together with Mr. Ford to define the factory-like setup and to define a lot of management rules that strangely but true still hold today. Uh, and, he, and he has a famous quote, and I do not agree with that quote at all. So he said, in the past, the, uh, the man has been first and the future system will be first, which is totally opposite to anything that I believe today and to anything also that we are seeing today. What I do believe is the following, that knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. We need to start, we need to start working on culture. Culture is not some, something that we can plan. Culture is something that emerges. We can set out the framework, we can set up certain, certain milestones, but we cannot say, hey guys, by this date, we will have, received, we will have achieved this level of culture. Not possible. So how do you actually build culture and what is culture? Because there are a lot of definitions. Like if you ask 10 people what DevOps is, you will get 10 different answers on DevOps. If you ask 10 people what, uh, what culture is, you will get 10 different uh, definitions of culture. I found a nice one by Th Seth, Seth Godin. Uh, and he basically says, people like us do things like this. And I like it. But what is, what is also, sorry, what this also means is that um, uh, as a team, we need to become self-aware. And how do we become self-aware? Well, we need to be very honest and candid about our strengths, about our weaknesses. Um, every, everyone has something to offer, uh, but we need to be honest about what it is that we have to offer. We need to be conscious about the, the weaknesses that we have while doubling down on our strengths instead of focusing on our weaknesses and trying to improve that. Um, so it starts with us, and once we have figured ourselves off, uh, ourselves, uh, once we have figured ourselves out, uh, the next step is to actually define a route. So we need to know where are we actually going to. What what is the northern star that we are aiming to get at with the with the team? So that means that we need to be super clear on our ambitions, on our values, and our principles, and that's what we actually did. So we worked a lot and. Uh, honestly, a lot. We spend a lot of time on uh, making our values as crystal clear as we could. We're making our principles as crystal clear as we could. But together with that, what we also did is we established the backbone of rituals of which we say, hey guys, this is what will actually help us keep keeping this, this momentum going. So we need to become more proactive also. We need to get out of that reactive mode because reactive basically means that we're always reacting to whatever reality brings to us while we want to be able to be in a position that we can work on the important stuff and not on the urgent stuff. Because if you leave anything long enough, it will become urgent by default. And that's not something that we want. So together with the, with the, with the, with the team, uh, what we basically did is we drew a blank sheet and we said, hey guys, this is us together. We are about 20 people. This is us together. How, do we, how should we actually be organized? So we reorganized the teams but everyone had influence in that. We now have three major pillars and we have one horizontal that's actually cross, uh, cross team. And we, what we also did is we removed unnecessary chains of command. What that means is there's no more, hey, Mr. Manager, this is what I basically need and give me your approval and then I can go up and then I can go down and then I can do my work and it's all lose of time. Lost, well, you lose time doing basically nothing, waiting for someone to to, to, to approve something, so that doesn't make sense. So if it makes sense, we just do. Um, and that, that means that our teams are empowered to do, uh, but that's incredibly what that actually means for speed, because that also puts the accountability with the teams. It doesn't put the accountability with the managers anymore, because you put the accountability where accountability should be. And it's not with one person, we have, we have spread it around um, uh, in the team itself. 
Um, and the funny thing is that we know that things will go wrong. We know that things will break. And that's also something that we anticipate. Um, and we expect whenever some, something breaks, we expect just the teams to come up and say, hey, guys, be honest. This happened. This is the reason why it happened. We investigated it. We know what the root cause is. We fixed it. Sorry for doing that. Or apologize. And just learn and move on. Um, and that's what we are, so that's what we are doing. But also what, what we see happening is that by instilling that accountability within the teams, they also have a desire to actually experiment. They actually have the desire to, to, to learn. They actually have the desire to get out of their uh, safe harbor, which is uh, uh, quite nice. Um, so what we are doing, what we're seeing the teams do is they're putting in a lot of hard work. They're avoiding blame. And that combination together, that's magical. So while we're um, uh, getting explicit about our, uh, about our principles um, and the way we want to work, and it's clear why we make certain choices, because that was in the past not always clear. It was like, yeah, but what are, you, what are your decisions based upon? And now it's documented, it's clear, it's there. So we need to start with figuring ourselves out as a team, what we value. We need to, f we need to focus on the who, not on the what and then the how. Next slide. And I believe in this. <laughs> this is one of my favorite slides, if not the favorite slide, um, because it talks about um, some skills that I believe will be tremendously important going forward. Speaking about leadership 1.0, this is leadership 2.0. This is where leadership 1.0 was paternal. It was like, hey, guys, I'm the big boss on the hill. This is maternal. This is soft softer, which we call soft skills, but I actually believe they will be life skills in the going forward. So we have empathy, we have self-awareness, and we have perspective. Um, and why do I believe in that? Well, I believe that you need to figure yourself out, not only as a team, but also as a person. What is it that I actually want to do? Um, I believe that you need to develop a level of empathy, of connection with the person that you're interacting with. Otherwise, there will be no change at all. I believe that you also need to have perspective. You need to be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and see the world from their view. And that's not a lot of things that, uh, uh, well, that, that people and certainly not leaders do. Because as leaders, what we need to do is we need to create one safety for people, but we also need to create the, the, the liminal space. We need to create a, a space for the teams to experiment. And with liminal space, I mean, hey guys, this is what we have today. This is what we want to go. This is where we want to go. And in that space in between, we should allow teams to actually experiment. But experiment not because, experiment according to your rules, but according to whatever the team comes up with. So. And whenever we have, we have those, so whenever we have empathy, self-awareness, self and perspective, and we connect on a real level, then we have trust. Trust is not something that you can enforce. I cannot say, hey, trust me. I know what I'm doing because you will be like, I don't know you. We have never connected. And connection is not something that you can put a date on. Connection needs to develop. And how do you develop it? How do you develop it? By talking to people, by actually caring about people, by actually putting some uh, marbles in a jar in that, in that emotional bank account. So what are some of the things, at least we have four things, what are some of the things that I think leaders should do uh, uh, to create that trust? Well, it's first, they should listen and they should really listen. I know that's boring. I know that has been said a lot of times. But there's a difference between listening and listening, right? So, and we should listen to employees. We should, we should ask questions because employees mostly have the answer to what needs to happen next. They are there with their feet in the ground. They know what's happening on the floor, but we need to be willing to, to hear the answer. Answer will not always be nice for leaders and for managers, but it is what it is, right? Um, uh, second one, we need to step out of our ivory tower. And with that, I mean, even as leaders and as managers, we need to put our feet in the ground. We need to be there wherever the employees are, wherever the customers are, wherever the real stuff is hitting the fan. Um, we don't need to micromanage. There's a big difference between that. Third one that I have is meritocracy. Meritocracy basically means give your best people the ability to shine. Um, uh, promote your best people faster than you promote other people. 
uh, don't make your best people leave because you're 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 not acting on whatever they're they're achieving. So, um, and then the last one that I have is uh, ownership, <laughs> and ownership basically means live with your decisions. Uh, that means that if you make a mistake, great, learn from it and move on. There's no point in dwelling, uh, just move on. And the, re the reason for ownership. Oh, good one. So how do you know as a leader that, that you're doing okay? Any ideas? Your? Exactly. Exactly. And the missing part in that answer is when you're not there. So the team does it. <laughs> no, no, but it's true. It's true. So you know that it's going as it should be going when everything is going, but you're not there. When the team is actually living and building on the culture, when you're not there. That's when you know that the, culture, that the, that the team is actually living the culture. Um, uh, and I think that's also one of the biggest rewards that you can get as a, as a leader, right? You should be able to just move away and see the, the, see the team being successful. Um, so we need to enable teams to do their best work as leaders. We need to remove barriers, preferably, and we need to let the team live up to their potential. Um, what else do I have here? So ultimately it's about uh, speed, speed. So why do we build this culture? We do this to generate speed. I think speed is one of the biggest variables, especially today and especially in the high tech industry. And how do you build speed? Well, you build speed by enabling teams, by avoiding negativity, by avoiding politics and all that stuff. I think that politics is one of the biggest poisons within teams because you will, what you will get is you will get People that are basically just afraid to speak up because they are afraid of being in meetings with certain people and so on. So, cut it. And the sooner we cut it out, the better. Um, and also, we build great culture as leaders by talking to people. We need to know from everyone what is it that motivates them every day. And I know that people will say, yeah, but I have 30 people reporting to me or 100 people reporting to me. That's great because that just means 100 lunches planned and we know whatever the people think, right? But we need to know. Not everyone cares about the same stuff as everyone else. Um, next slide. Um, this is a slide by uh, Dame Minouche. Um, and I think this, this, is a, this is a very cool slide. Because what she said is in the past, jobs were about muscle. We had the Industrial Revolution. Oh, sorry. Uh, now they're about brains. And in the future, they'll be about the heart. And I think that the future is here. Not a lot of people see it yet, but the future is here. We are actually living it. Um, and the reason why not everyone sees it is because a lot of managers and leaders are focused on the, on the short term, are focused on the quick gains. While what you see is if you take a step back and just focus on the, on the long game, it is already here. This is something that we can do today. Um, and legacy matters. What we, what we give to the team matters if we know what it is that we want to accomplish. So if we are self-aware. Uh, behavior matters, intent matters, positivity matters, optimism matters, uh, uh, how we treat other people matters. Um, we need to keep going. We need to create more space, also safety for teams. We need to create more, more, more of that backbone. We need, to, we need to enable the teams. And we need to stop comparing ourselves with others. I know that it's a human trait, right? So, hey, but my neighbor has this, so I also want this. Hey, but company X did it like this, so we should also do it like this. Yeah, but company X adopted framework Y, and if we do it also, then we'll achieve bullshit. We'll never do the same. We need to compare ourselves to where we were yesterday. We need to make sure that we are actually progressing. And how do we create that culture that gets better and more resilient every day? Well, it's the one-on-one -on -one engagements with our team. It's the actively listening. It's the collecting the data that we actually want and then uh, making decisions based on that. That's it. That's it. Any questions so far? No?
Go on. I do have one. It's a bit of a bugbear of mine. It's the documentation of stuff when you're moving fast. Yeah. And do you have any advice on how to encourage people on the team that may, might hate writing stuff up and documenting the <laughs> thought processes? Depends. Depends how you do, how you define documentation. Yeah, I know. We have the, we have the same. We have the same. Because the, 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 the issue that we are having is that there's a difference between going very fast and making sure that everything is documented. So what we did is, one, we got, a lot, we got uh, rid of a lot of documentation that we had because a lot was just legacy and doesn't, didn't make sense anymore. But also we are writing it in a much more condensed way and we are not... I'm not saying that we are there yet, that we have it all up to date. But at least we have, we, have, we have some processes in place to make sure that we regularly review them. For example, what I said about the, the teams being accountable, we know which teams are accountable for which processes and for which documentation. And well, it's up to them to, uh, to do that. And we do some spot checks, but we don't, we don't enforce it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Pleasure. Anything else? Anyone else? So, Hey, this is my favorite part, by the way. I like it. <laughs> uh, DevOps is often about speed, and security kind of gets in the way of speed. How do you balance going fast with not leaving giant holes? What we do, um, what we do is we talk to the so. I think two ways. What we're trying to do is one, we're trying to automate a lot of controls so that the controls are automatically uh, in there from the beginning, right? Uh, that's one. Second thing that we are doing is we're also, as a cybersecurity department, playing kind of consultancy role. And consultancy role, I mean that we have people deployed throughout the company. Whenever there are big projects, security is one of the mandatory uh, uh, checks that we need to do. So, uh, so an approval from security is one of the mandatory checks that we, that we, that we do. So that's that. So we have basically enforced ourselves to be there from the beginning till the end. And I don't think there's a, there's another way. Even if even if people think that it's cumbersome and or that it that it yeah that security is a, is a pain, it needs to happen and needs to be part of the part of the process. That's it. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Let me share the gift. Cool. Well, once upon a time. You can turn it Okay, cool. So, once upon a time. Once upon a time, there was this king. And this king had the habit of, whenever his birthday was, of giving a gift to his people. This was a special year. He was turning 50. And for his 50th birthday, he said to the guys, he said, he said to all the wise people, so all the philosophers, to the scientists, to whoever was in the room, he said, um, guys, um, for this 50th birthday, I want to give my people a special gift. I want to give them the gift of knowledge. So he said, I want you to actually go out, spread yourself around the world, collect all the, all the wisdom of the world, and show me what you what you came up with. You have about eight weeks to do it. So the guys went out throughout the world, wandered around, gathered all the data. Exactly eight weeks eight weeks later, they come back and they say, "Hey guys, uh, 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 we found it all. So hey King, we have it. We have all the all the data in the world. So great. The King joins them to a room. Sees a room full of books, full of papers, full of whatever whatever you can think of. Great and." It's, King is like, wow, you actually did it. You collected all the wisdom of the world. But he said, this is too much. I cannot just hand this over to my people. So he said, what I want you to do is I want you to basically summarize this. I want you to summarize this. You get another three weeks, uh, summarize it, make it a two-pager, and a two-pager will always work. Great, so scientists were like, fuck, we need to summarize. So they, they go back, start summarizing, start scratching, cutting, copying and they summarize it. At the deadline, they approached the king again and said, king, 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 we have it. We have two sheets in our hands. This is it, this is the wisdom of all, of all the world. The king takes the papers, reads them, and says, wow, guys, this is really fantastic. I mean, this is, this is it, this is gold, we got it. But he says, this is still too much. I want you to do differently. I want you to summarize it in one sentence, 
in 10 words of two letters. Does anyone have any idea what those 10 letters of two words are? I have it here on my wrist. So, Isaac, can you come up? You have a microphone, right? No. Okay. What does it say? I'll leave it here. You can speak into my... If it is to be, it is up to me. Exactly. If it is to be, it is up to me. And what I want to say with that, best audience in the world, <laughs> what I want to say with that is, um, if you take all the lessons that you've learned so far, if you take everything that you learned today, if you take everything that you learn in the future and you do nothing with it, this was absolutely the biggest waste of time that we could have done. So if we want something to happen, it's up to us to make it happen. We need to action. If we want to change the culture in the company, we need to step up. We need to make it happen. If you, what you take today, if you action upon it, you have a chance of changing it. That's it. And that's my gift to you. <laughs>